Perfect. Well, hello, everyone. It is a pleasure to be with you and welcome everyone from various parts of the United States and from around the world. My name is Nuno Fernandez. I'm the president of American Public University System. I hope you have been enjoying our sessions over the last two days, and I'm proud to introduce our next special guest speaker, who is the chairman of the House of Representatives Bipartisan Task Force on Artificial Intelligence, U.S. Congressman Jay Obernalty. I had the pleasure of meeting Congressman Obernalty a few months ago at Capitol Hill where we had the chance to briefly discuss the opportunities and risks of AI for higher education. I am honored and thrilled that the Congressman accept our invitation to join us today as the head of the Bipartisan AI Task Force, one of the most important AI initiatives currently happening on the Hill, if not the most important one. A video game developer and business owner, Congressman Obernalty proudly serves on the House Committee on Energy and Commerce, where he's a member of the Subcommittee on Communications and Technology, the Subcommittee on Health, and the Subcommittee on Innovation, Data, and Commerce. He also serves on the House Committee on Science, Space, and Technology as the Chairman of the Subcommittee on Investigations and Oversight. Congressman Obernalty lives in Big Bear Lake, California, with his wife, Heather, and their two sons, Hale and Troy. In addition to owning a video game development studio, Congressman Obernalty is a certified flight instructor and a martial arts teacher. With that, it is my pleasure to introduce and welcome U.S. Congressman Jay Obernolte. Welcome, Congressman. Oh, excellent. Okay. Well, hello, everyone. I'm Congressman Jay Obernolte. It's an honor to be here today uh, as a representative and chairman of the House Artificial Intelligence Task Force. Uh, I am absolutely convinced that AI is a technology that's going to change the world for the better, and I think most of the people on this call would agree with me. But it's also undeniably true that artificial intelligence has some substantial potential drawbacks. And I think it's uh, the job of government to help to mitigate those uh, hazards. So we're trying to navigate uh, that uh, that intersection between AI and governance and put in place the safeguards that need to be put in place while still enabling innovation and the development of AI to thrive in the United States. So let me tell you a, bit, a little bit about myself. Uh, I. I uh, am someone who is deeply passionate about AI. Little known fact about me is that when I was in high school, my ambition in life was to be a researcher in AI. When I was in fifth grade, my father brought home an Apple II computer from work, and he gave that uh, to me with a book on how to teach yourself to program in BASIC. And that catalyzed a lifelong learning, uh, a love of uh, learning about computer science in me. Uh, I uh, published my first piece of commercial software when I was in high school, and I went to Caltech uh, pursuing a degree in computer engineering with the goal of being a, an academic and a researcher in AI. Uh, at the time, because AI had very few obvious near-term commercial applications, if you wanted to do advanced research and development work on AI, the only way to do that was through academia. So that was my plan. Uh, I got my degree at Caltech, I went on, to uh, pursue a PhD at UCLA in artificial intelligence, doing some of the very early work in natural language processing and computer vision. Uh, when uh, something happened that changed my life, my side hustle, which was writing video game software took off and uh, one of my games uh, went platinum and became a hit. And that deflected me out of a career in academia into a career in business. But uh, I, I still retain that that love of artificial intelligence. And uh, it seems to me a very strange symmetry that uh, here 30 years later in life, I find myself uh, helping to direct the federal effort to uh, to govern uh, artificial intelligence. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the philosophy of the task force and, and the purpose of the task force. So uh, the task force was formed er early this year. It came out of a working group that we had last year in the 118th Congress on artificial intelligence. And uh, this year, uh, we have an official task force with 24 members uh, with a defined goal of by the end of the year, producing a report uh, that details a proposed federal regulatory framework for artificial intelligence. So uh, that's obviously a, a big task, but I think we're up for it. Uh, the 24 members that we have on our task force come from a wide variety of different backgrounds. Uh, what I asked the speaker for when we formed the task force were a couple of things. Uh, first of all, I, it was very important to me that the task force be bipartisan. Uh, it's pretty clear that no matter what happens with uh, the political winds of fortune, we're going to have a narrowly divided government for at least the next decade in this country. And that means that anything that's substantive that gets done from a policy perspective is going to have to be 
bipartisan. So uh, that was very important to me to, to make it bipartisan. And so I, I wanted to avoid the usual practice of having the majority party control a majority of the seats on uh, on every policy committee. Uh, I thought it was important just to acknowledge going in, anything is going to be bipartisan, so let's have an equal number of representatives from each side of the aisle. And another thing that was important to me is that uh, we have representation from lots of different policy committees on Capitol Hill. Uh, if we had been constituted as a select committee instead of a task force, uh, we would have gotten into jurisdictional fights with all of the existing policy committees about whether or not we had the right to legislate on the topic of artificial intelligence or if they did. And looking at the regulatory landscape, it seems clear that the work product that the task force produces when we start writing legislation is going to require input from lots of different policy committees. I mean, obviously, uh, the technology-related things that we legislate on are going to go to science space and technology or they'll go to energy and commerce but also we've got some very thorny issues to solve with respect to intellectual property those will go to judiciary uh, we have uh, a lot of national security things that will go to uh, oversight or intelligence we've got uh, armed services uh, committee is going to weigh in on a lot of the legislation that we write and so it was very clear to me that that uh we needed buy-in from all of these committees. And so that's what I asked the speaker and the minority leader to do is to appoint us members that would be representatives from all of these other committees and that could then, uh, once we surface disagreements in the task force and resolve them, could then, then go uh, evangelize what we had done to all of the different policy committees. So uh, we have a, a really diverse group on the task force and uh, I am, I'm just overjoyed at the quality of members that we have. So I want to talk about... Uh, you know, kind of some of the, the decisions that we're grappling with on the task force. And probably the most near-term and serious is the decision of whether or not we follow the lead of entities like the European Union and uh, spin up a brand new bureaucracy with a universal licensing requirement for anything that's AI related. Uh, that's what the EU has done. They passed last year a 3,000 page bill called the AI Act. Uh, and that's going to require a, a brand new bureaucracy to to uh, to administer, and it's going to require that uh, anyone using artificial intelligence in anything but a low risk usage context is going to have to apply for essentially permission from the government to do that, a, a license from this new entity. Or should we empower our existing sectoral regulators to regulate within their sectoral spaces? So this is the decision that we have uh, to make. And really, uh, it is a fork in the road because we can't do both. Uh, I think we are almost uh, unanimously in favor of the latter, uh, of empowering our sectoral regulators. And let me tell you uh, a couple of uh, reasons for that. The, uh, the whole point of governing AI, I think, has to have a purpose. Uh, and if your purpose for imposing regulation is regulating itself, I think you've embarked on a fool's errand. I think you have to have a reason for regulating. And in the case of artificial intelligence, it's pretty clear to me that the reason for regulating is protection of consumers against potential harms, both uh, intentional and unintentional. Uh, and if that is our purpose, if that's the reason why government is getting involved with artificial intelligence, then it really clarifies what our job is, because uh, we then are tasked with identifying what those potential hazards are and those potential negative outcomes, and then devising actions that will mitigate those uh, harmful effects. Uh, and uh, I, I think that's appropriate. And uh, the international community has actually come around also to that way of thinking. Uh, we've done a lot of, of deep uh, thinking and planning about uh, about the risks of AI. And uh, the, the, the U.S. has been one of the international leaders on this. I think uh, most everyone saw the, that uh, NIST came up with a, ri a risk management framework for artificial intelligence a few months ago. And it's been acknowledged as uh, pretty much the furthest thinking document in, uh, in terms of quantifying the risk of artificial intelligence that's yet been created. And if you read that framework, it's uh, it's interesting to see that the, the approach NIST is taking is that the risks of AI are highly contextual. So it matters very much how you're using AI uh, when it comes to the risks that that AI poses. So an algorithm that you're considering might be completely unacceptably risky in one usage context, 
uh, and yet pose absolutely zero risk and be completely benign in another usage context. It, it very much depends what you're doing with that AI. I mean, for example, in a commercial context, if you're using that AI to make uh, consequential decisions, for example, uh, underwriting mortgages, uh, that's very risky. That, that comes with substantial risks to consumers if the AI has unintended biases built into it. However, if you're using AI in a video game, for example, the risk the usages uh, of that are, are much lower or to make a non-consequential decision are much lower, even if the AI itself is completely identical. So uh, th this is very important because it, it can crystallize the way that we approach the governance of AI. Uh, one thing that I think a lot of people don't realize is that uh, AI is already largely regulated. Uh, I think a lot of people... Uh, first of all, we have a lot of fear around AI because uh, AI has been informed by 50 years of pop culture and science fiction and public opinion of AI, I think, is not terribly realistic when it comes to what AI is and what it isn't, uh, what it can do and what it can't do and what the actual risks are. I think if you ask the average American, what are the long term, you know, worst case scenarios for artificial intelligence, you'll get an answer out of a, a Terminator movie, right, where an army of evil robots rise up to take over the world with their red laser eyes. Uh, but we know that's actually not a realistic worst case for AI. We don't worry about that as much as we worry about other uh, equally serious and consequential uh, harms like the spread of mis disinformation, uh, uh, intellectual property infringement, the use of AI by malicious actors uh, to pierce through digital data privacy, the use of AI uh, to enable cyber theft and cyber attacks. Uh, these are all things that, that have very serious negative consequence potentially for Americans. Uh, and yet that's not what the public is thinking about. So uh, we need to do a better job of informing the public about what those risks are. Uh, but we also need to do a better job of informing the public about the fact that government is already having to grapple with this issue. And I'll give you a couple of examples. Uh, the FDA has already processed over 900 applications for the use of AI and medical devices. Think about that, 900 applications. Uh, and it's hard to imagine a usage that is more potentially risky than a, a medical device. I mean, something that's either a diagnostic test or potentially a device that's being implanted in someone's body. I mean, that that is a pretty consequential uh, usage of AI. And yet the FDA is already having to navigate this space. And they're doing it guided by their decades of experience in ensuring patient safety. And what they've done is they they, they view the governance of AI within the medical space uh, as an extension of their responsibility to ensure patient safety in general in medical devices. And as it turns out, that philosophy has served them very well. Uh, most of the stakeholders are in universal agreement that the FDA has done a pretty solid job of trying to, to mitigate risk while, while still allowing uh, AI to innovate within the space of medical devices. Uh, so. Uh, I mean, I think that that was really eye-opening for me to hear that because, uh, uh, you know, it really belies this idea that AI is so different that it needs a different bureaucracy to manage it. Uh, and this is true in a lot of different sectoral spheres uh, within the federal government. Uh, the FAA is already, already having to deal with the use of AI in autonomous flight systems. Uh, NHTSA is already having to worry about the use of AI for autonomously piloted vehicles. Uh, Every federal agency is having to grapple with with uh, AI, and and I, and I don't want to underscore the seriousness of the task ahead. I mean, the, these agencies are going to need resources to be able to do this. They're going to need uh, technical talent. Uh, they're going to need a, a pool of uh, compute. They're going to need regulatory test beds for the testing of potentially malicious AI. All of those things are true, you know, but... Uh, None of that should distract from the fact that it is much easier to teach the FDA what it might not already know about AI than it would be to teach a brand new agency everything that the FDA already knows about ensuring patient safety. So this is the the uh, the the one of the findings I think that the task force has reached is that uh, we're on the right path here with sectoral regulation. Uh, another thing that we're trying to communicate to people, and it's, it's come out very clearly in our hearings, uh, in this country, we believe in regulating outcomes. We don't believe so much in the regulation of tools. We regulate the outcome of those tools, and that really clarifies the role of federal government. And let me give you some examples. So uh, we we talked a moment ago about the potential use of AI for uh, uh, for cyber theft. 
But that shouldn't distract from the fact that theft is already illegal. Cyber crimes are already illegal. We don't need another law to make the use of AI illegal for stealing someone's money. It's already illegal to steal someone's money. Uh, so, uh, you know, the, the, this this idea that we're, we have to regulate the tool and not the outcome, I think, is counter to the governing philosophy that we've had in this country, one that served us extremely well. And certainly law enforcement agencies are going to need the resources to go after the malicious use of AI to steal people's money. Certainly uh, they're going to need training. Certainly the law is going to need tweaking. You know, when when questions arise about whether or not uh, the use of AI is illegal in some edge cases, but you know the meat, the, the the middle of those cases, it's it's already clear, and that's true even in some of the potentially hazardous cases uh, the, 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 that are specific to AI. And let me give you an example uh, that that probably people have heard about, uh, because just in the last couple of years, we've done a lot of uh, talking about how bias, unintended biases, get introduced into AI. So uh, several years ago, there was a well-publicized case where a company had come up with uh, an artificial intelligence powered algorithm for the automated screening of resumes. Everyone hear about this? Uh, and the idea was to use AI to help companies in that step between when they have a job opening and they get 10,000 resumes you know, to, to winnow that down to the 100 people that were going to get callbacks and screening from a human. Right, that first step in the screening of resumes. In in hindsight, we would recognize that as a potentially you know very risky use of AI because uh, of that's a very consequential decision. You know whether or not you make it past that first hurdle is could be the difference between whether or not you get a job. And so it's very important that we understand what AI is doing and what it's doing, uh, why it's doing it. But th this this was kind of early days, and as it turns out, the algorithm that they developed had some very troubling biases built into it. They didn't intentionally uh, make it discriminatory, but as it turns out it was discriminatory. It discriminated on the base of, uh, of race and socioeconomic background. And it was pretty easily proven that that was the case. So it was good that that was that flaw was discovered. Uh, it was good that it was unintentional. It taught us a lot about the way those biases can creep into algorithms. It was uh, those were uh, essentially the algorithm had been fi fed biased training data, and that made introduce those biases into the algorithm. And it was great that it was corrected. The company recognized it and corrected it. Uh, but none of that should distract from the fact that discrimination in hiring is already illegal. And it doesn't matter if you use AI to do that discrimination or if you use some other way method of doing that discrimination. So even if that algorithm had been commercially deployed, the moment it was discovered to be discriminatory, the law already requires companies to stop using it or face some serious liability. So for example, we don't need a law that says you can't use AI to discriminate in hiring practice because we already have laws that say you can't discriminate. Uh, and I think that when you think about that, you know, it really clarifies what what our job is on the task force. So uh, I call this the hub and spoke approach, you know, where we give our our hubs, our existing sectoral regulators, uh, the tools that they need and a centralized resource, which I mean, I'm sorry, those are the spokes. The, the, the hub is the centralized resource uh, the, the, of the tools and, and, uh, and the technology and the staffing that they need to accomplish the goal of regulating AI within their sectoral spaces. Uh, and uh, this also accomplishes something else, you know, that that nothing that we're, we're talking about potential malicious use of AI, potential negative consequences on society. Uh, we also need to do the job of talking about the potential uh, upsides of AI, you know, the potential beneficial uh, effects of AI on society. And the number one thing about AI and the point that we need to be making, in my opinion, is the fact that AI has the potential to be the most powerful tool for enhancing human productivity that mankind has ever come up with in the 5,000 years that we've had human civilizations. Uh, and that's an incredibly important goal. I mean, enhancing human productivity. And I'm not talking about just in a commercial sense. I'm talking about in all of the different facets of our lives. Uh, focusing just on economic factors, though, think about the fact that in the last 200 years of uh, of the United States' economic history, every single major economic expansion of our gross domestic product 
has been heralded by a corresponding increase in the productivity of the American workforce. I mean, you really cannot have one without the other. Increasing worker productivity is what drives the increase in economic activity in our country. And uh, if you couple that with what AI is capable of doing in terms of enhancing productivity, I believe that AI is going to be the next big, powerful tool that boosts worker productivity uh, and enables a rising wave of prosperity that literally lifts all the boats in America. Uh, and I think it's coming at a particularly opportune time because in the last six years, we've seen a gradual decline in worker productivity. We're still suffering the after effects of the COVID pandemic, and we haven't gotten uh, to, to an upswing again. And I think AI is going to do that. So it's very important when we approach the governance of AI that we enable its beneficial effects to occur. Uh, we could, as some futurists have proposed, we could step in and impose a national ban on the development of advanced research, uh, 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 on the uh, development of, of advanced AI. Uh, some uh, futurists have called for that, and then some people I deeply respect. Uh, but the problem is, you know, that that would also deny everyone the be the beneficial effects of AI. Uh, and if you buy into this idea that AI is a powerful enhancer of human productivity, why would you want to deny Americans that tool? So we need to do the, this balancing act. These two ideas are intention. One, that AI can be used in a potentially harmful way, and government has an obligation to prevent that, which I agree with. But this other idea is that AI could be tremendously beneficial, and it's government's job also to enable those beneficial uses. And those two ideas are intention. Uh, but I think that uh, that's a balance that that we can get right and we will get right. Uh, and then just lastly, before we go to question and answers here, I wanted to talk about the effects of AI on education. Uh, I think it's already pretty clear that AI will be the most powerful tool for the dispersal of human knowledge that mankind has ever invented. Uh, AI can already teach you just about anything that you want to know in whatever learning style is optimal for you. Uh, and as the development of uh, frontier AI becomes uh, more pervasive uh, and the deployment becomes more pervasive, you're going to see that adoption more and more by uh, the average American. Uh, I think it's going to catalyze uh, not just greater dispersal of knowledge, an easier learning, but I think it's going to catalyze a complete sea change when it comes to the way that we approach education. Uh, for the last hundred years, we've embraced an educational model where uh, we expect young people to go acquire an education in their youth. And then uh, they use that education as a tool to go out and have a career for the rest of their lives. So it's education first, you get this education, and then you use this education for the next 50 years of your career. Uh, I think it's already very apparent that that model is completely outdated. You know, that the society, technology, and knowledge are moving so quickly that this idea that one could acquire an education at the beginning of your life and then have that education be good for the rest of your life uh, is, is fallacious, right? Uh, I think we all have an obligation to be lifelong learners now. We all have to refresh our knowledge periodically because the state of knowledge is moving so quickly and because technology is moving so quickly. So once you've accepted that, you have to start questioning the idea of uh, education being something that you acquire in advance of your career in the first place. Education is something that we are all gonna have to acquire and use throughout our lives. And yes, we would hope as humans, we get to continue to develop throughout our lives, but it's certainly no longer going to be the case that uh, that a, a, an education is acquired at the beginning and then can be depended on your entire career. Well, AI is the perfect tool for this because in addition to being so comprehensive, it is also a uh, user directed. And uh, it, it, it really crystallizes what our job then is as educators. It's to enable uh, the acquisition of knowledge and to teach people how to learn, uh, to prove that they can learn uh, and to teach them how to use the tools at their disposal. And yes, I mean, periodically, we're going to need 
a human input. The, the teachers, the need for teachers is not going to way, go away. The need for educators is not going to go away. The need for educational assistant, uh, uh, educational institutions is not going to go away. But I think uh, the, the way that we think about education and our philosophy of educating people is going to radically change as a result of AI. Uh, and yes, it's going to be disruptive. It absolutely will. But think about this. Uh, beneficial technologies are, are, are always disruptive. I mean, you can go to the most recent example of the internet to see that disruption, but uh, you can go all the way back to the advent of the printing press to see how disruptive it was. And if you go back and you read some of the historical literature from that time, the printing press completely changed people's relationships with their government, with their church, with their employers. Uh, it was radically different from what came before. You know, this idea that, that people for the first time uh, were in, empowered to educate themselves by reading something on a printed page, something that was available in the previous generation only to wealthy people, uh, now suddenly was democratized and available to everybody. And AI is going to enable that same transformation to occur in education. Knowledge is going to be something that uh, only requires someone's desire to, to, to achieve and uh, no longer requires uh, something like uh, you know the, the 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 money to pay for it or uh, social positioning to be able to go to a good school to get it, and I think it's going to be a wonderful thing to for society. And we're going to definitely going to have to to put put in guardrails to guard against some of this disruption. We're going to have to enhance our social safety net. We're going to have to invest not only in education, uh, early education on how to use AI. Uh, we're going to have to do retraining and reskilling for the people whose uh, whose industries are disrupted and and where job loss occurs. But uh, those are all jobs of government, you know, certainly. But uh, that shouldn't distract from the fact this is going to be an incredibly exciting time to be not only in education, but to be an American and to be a part of our society. So uh, it, it's uh, going to be amazing to, to go through it. Uh, I'm very excited about it. Uh, I, I'm, we should have talk again after the task force comes out with our report. We're going to do that by the end of the year. Uh, and I hope that that forms a to-do list for future Congresses, because it's not going to be a piece of legislation. It's going to re report that says, this is what we think Congress ought to do. And it's going to be incumbent on future Congresses to go down all of the different things that we recommend uh, and, and actually take legislative action on those. So uh, I wanted to leave a bunch of time for questions and answers here at the end, but I'm happy to answer any questions that people might have. Nuno, are you moderating, or am I just reading off the? Uh... No, it's 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 no, me. No, Congressman, uh, uh, Dr. Asher is moderating. Uh, okay. I, um, actually, the the couple questions that we've had here, you've done a really good job of answering them as you continued, but but let me cover a, a couple of what they are. One of the con questions raised um, the issue that you've been just talking about, which is the potential for job displacement due to the changes in um, AI uh, on the workforce. Uh, now you've partially uh, addressed this. I think what is evolves from this question is, is the task force specifically uh, working on measures that would bring that balance you just referred to in uh, the changes in uh, the American workforce? Yeah, uh, the answer is absolutely we are. It's something that we take very seriously. And it's something that we feel the government has uh, a large role to play in mitigating. Uh, but I want to be very clear that it is a fool's errand to try to prevent job displacement. You know, if you, you can't do a prevention of displacement without... Right limiting the upside, the beneficial uses of AI, the, the lower prices it can bring to consumers, the, the empowerment that it brings there, uh, you're going to get displacement. Uh, but if you look at the advent of the internet, that was, that was uh, very disruptive uh, and continues to be disruptive on our workforce. But on balance, it has created jobs, not destroyed jobs, and not by a little bit, by a lot. And we feel very strongly that artificial intelligence is going to be similar, uh, that it is going to because of the way it enhances productivity, uh, it is going uh, to certainly lead to some job displacement, but it's going to create opportunities in lots of other different places. And at the end of the day, when the dust settles, uh, we think that there's going to be more jobs for humans, not fewer jobs for humans. 
Uh, but it, it definitely falls to government to make sure that we ease that transition. There will be, we're very worried about uh, uh, older members of the workforce that might not be uh, well positioned to be able to learn how to use AI to empower themselves. Uh, we're worried about supporting them. Uh, we're worried about reskilling people in the middle of the workforce who uh, are accustomed to doing things one way and are going to have to accept the role of doing things a different way. Uh, and uh, we're worried about making sure that young people uh, come into the workforce with the skills that they're going to need to succeed. And uh, what we're talking about job displacement, uh, let, let me talk about you know a very recent example of the way that society is already grappling with this problem. Uh, I'm sure most people in my home state is California. Uh, we recently had a strike of the uh, script screenwriters and the Screen Actors Guild relating to the use of AI by movie studios to create movie scripts. And the script writers were pretty adamant that uh, they did not want AI to be used to write scripts because their perception was that would result in fewer jobs for script writers, which you know, I think all of us can understand why they would be concerned about that. But uh, from a societal standpoint, I don't think that they are thinking big enough. Uh, if you imagine, you know, fast forward 20 years, imagine a world where generative AI has become so powerful that when you go on Netflix and you watch a show, you're not watching a show that's made the same way for everybody. You're much, watching a piece of programming that's made just for you based on the things that you like to watch. Uh, and you think about how empowering that will be for script writers. I mean, it, that will create many, many more jobs for script writers. And yes, it will be script writers that understand how to use AI to empower themselves and to help them write scripts in the, this, this format of a generative AI that makes individualized content. But you know, still, many more jobs, not fewer jobs. So why would we as a society take a stance uh, of reflexively trying to prevent that? So the, these are the, the the conflicts that we are going to have to, uh, to to navigate over the next couple of years. And I think you're going to see these issues come up uh, again and again. Uh, but I, I think we need to figure fo all focus on the big picture as a society. And as long as we do things that are beneficial for everyone and we put in place the social safety net and, and the retraining and reskilling that needs to be done to protect the people who are being displaced, uh, I think we're going to be in a good place. Oh, but that does not that beg the question then if AI can be that can be that interactive with with say my preferences, can't I create my own story with an interaction with AI? Do I need a scriptwriter in between us? No, maybe you don't, but uh, I'll tell you right now, uh, I could tell you that uh, it might be interesting to watch a story uh, set back in medieval times where a king, uh, uh, captures a castle and rescues the princess. But if you ask me to actually write dialogue in a scene between where the king is wooing the princess and act, asking for her hand in marriage, I would be terrible at it, right? That's not something that I can do. Uh, even if I was making that content, I would need a script writer to fill in those pieces. Okay, fair enough. Um, another question relating, you just mentioned, I think that's what triggered the question, that the, your task force is... Uh, boy, what a lot of work that is, is we're creating um, um, a list of recommendations for the end of the year, I believe you said. A question from that it, uh, is posed, AI is evolving at lightning speed. Um, how will the governance of the committee keep current once it's put forward? And here's a related question that goes with it, the related. When this task force comes to an end at the end of the year, will there be a subsequent monitoring group about the advancement of AI? Right. Uh, that, those are great questions. Uh, I'll tell you one thing that has been already a, a positive impact of the task force that uh, I completely did not anticipate, and perhaps I should have, is that uh, because the 24 members of our task force have done such a deep dive on this topic, I mean, I think we're, we had our, our 13th hearing uh, last week, and we'll have a few more here before we wrap up for the year. Uh, and they've been on a wide variety of different topics, all the way from uh, national security to in intellectual property protections and uh, everything in between. Uh, we have created a deep uh, pool of knowledge within the House uh, on the issue of artificial intelligence. And uh, just having done that would have been worth the effort. 
Uh, and I, I had not thought about that when we put the task force together, but we now have uh, a substantial number of members who are really informed and spun up on this issue. So uh, that is one of the things that I think we need to keep doing. Uh, as to the question of what happens to the task force next year and what approach will we take, uh, the next year will be the, the first session of the 119th Congress. So the Speaker of the House, whoever that might be, will have to make that decision. I hope that he comes to talk to both me and my co-chair, Congressman Liu, uh, about what should be done. Uh, I hope that they recognize that this is something that we're still go we're going to need a, a, a continued focused group to uh, to act on. I don't know if that is a task force or if it's a select committee or if you chop up the responsibilities and you delegate them to the existing policy committees. Uh, but one of those things has to be true. Uh, and we're, we're going to actually try to prove the pipeline a little bit because there are some, some low-hanging fruit uh, in terms of AI-related legislation that I think need to be passed more urgently and should be passed this year. And so as we transition from having hearings on the various topics of AI into actually creating a report, the task force is going to have a little bit of bandwidth to try and actually get behind and push legislation. So uh, we have a, an upcoming markup on AI-related legislation in the Science, Space, and Technology Committee, uh, which I sit on and I'm a subcommittee chairman. Uh, that was supposed to happen last week, but unfortunately the House left uh, for the, uh, the uh, district work period uh, a week early, so we didn't get that done. But when we come back in September, uh, we will have that hearing and we're going to move legislation out of committee. We're going to put it on the floor. I've been assured that we're going to get some floor time before the end of the year. Um, and uh, I'm also working with my uh, colleagues in the Senate and I'm hoping that we can get a handful of AI-related bills actually passed and signed into law this year. And not only will that solve some of the more urgent problems uh, in AI, but also it'll prove the legislative pathway. And I think that that's very important going into next year so that everyone gets a sense of how this job gets done. Because as I've said, the, the report we're producing is a recommendation and a kind of a checklist. Here are the things that we think Congress needs to do. And con future Congresses are going to have to work, work through that checklist and actually get them done. And if we've given them a template as to how that happens, uh, I think that that will be very helpful. The, um, and that's good news. I, I think um, this is certainly not a question or a package of issues that has an end time. Um, stamped on it. <laughs> no, no, is... you're, you're right about that. And that's one of the reasons why we are trying to disabuse people of the notion that this is a one and done problem, that AI right. that can pass a 3000 page bill and, you know, all done. The, uh, the, the problem is now solved. We're, you know, we're, we, now we can move on. You know, this is something that uh, we're going to be doing a handful of AI related bills every year for the next couple of decades, I think. Uh, and I think that's appropriate because the, the landscape technologically is changing so quickly. Uh, another participant has, has asked a good question. And this relates, um, in, at least in part, to intellectual property issues and access to information uh, by AI. What about the IT companies that control these algorithms and use them to their advantage. For example, using all data in the internet to train their AI, monetize and not give a penny to the writer or artist who share his or her talents online. Yeah, that's a concern that I very much share. Uh, we had a hearing on this uh, several weeks ago on uh, the, the use of copyrighted material to train uh, AI. And we also talked about some other intellectual property related issues, for example, the use of generative AI uh, to create content that infringes on existing copyrights, whether or not works of generative AI are themselves copyrightable, and if so, who holds the, those copyrights? Those are all issues that are going to have to get clarified. Uh, however, there are a couple of pending court cases that are going to give a, a lot of more visibility to this issue. And I, I think probably the premier one is the New York Times lawsuit. And the courts are going to weigh in. And what uh, what I think you'll see in our task force report is that we want to see if the courts can succeed in uh, extending the doctrine of fair use, which is one that has served us well for the last 200 years, uh, to this concept of the use of of 
data to train AI and what what is fair use of that data and what's not. Uh, and I'm hopeful that maybe the doctrine of fair use can be extended that way, because uh, that would mean that the the way that the AI algorithm itself is used would matter as to whether or not that was an infringement. Uh, we'll see if that happens. Uh, I think that probably the courts are going to get most of the way there and that they're going to need some help from Congress in clarifying some issues where written law already does not exist. Uh, but we're, we're going to see and uh, we'll probably have some of those ans early answers in months, not years. So, uh, you know, but we're, we're going to look at that. Uh, you, you hit on another topic, though, that I think is very important, which is something I'm concerned about, the concentration of economic power in the hands of just a few companies that develop these frontier level AI algorithms. Exactly. Uh, I am very worried about that because uh, of the capital resources necessary to train AI. I mean, the, the current generation of chat GPT, it's estimated cost $100 million to train. The next generation will be about 400 million. And uh, the generation after that will be a billion dollars of capital investment required. Uh, so we have an antitrust obligation to make sure that that economic power is not concentrated in too few hands. Uh, and I think we also have an obligation to make sure that cutting edge research in artificial intelligence continues to be done in academic settings. You know, we have a rich tradition in this country of uh, advanced R&D being done uh, in academia, uh, coupled with the tradition of uh, transparency, of publication, and of peer review. And it's very important that that research on AI continues to be done there because uh, that that's a much more transparent and open process than research that gets done behind closed doors uh, untransparently where data is only released to the public when it benefits the person releasing it. Uh, so uh, we are working on that. Actually, this Congress, we have a bill that I'm co-sponsor of called the Create AI Act. And uh, what it will do is establish NAIR, the National AI Research Resource, that is a pool of compute and training data available to uh, academic institutions and entrepreneurs. Uh, and so we want to make sure that the cost of compute and the cost of training and the energy required to do that and access to the data required to training that uh, to do that is not concentrated in just a few companies that can afford to pay for it. Uh, and I, I am optimistic. That's one of the bills that we're going to be marking up in science, space and technology in September. And I'm optimistic that we're going to get that done. Oh, well, that's good news. Sounds I'm I'm, I'm going to go find that bill. All right. What's the. With the recent one last question, we have just enough time. With the recent Supreme Court decision that reversed and weakened the Chevron doctrine, how much power do you, do you feel the regulatory institutions will truly have in their ability to regulate AI going forward? That's a great question. Mm -hmm. It is a wonderful question, and uh, it's it's a topic. Uh, it's funny. I had I have conversations with. Uh, both the chair of the FCC and the chair of the FTC about this exact issue just in the last week. Uh, I'm optimistic here. You know, she what Chevron says is that uh, agencies within the executive branch should not exercise power that has not been granted to them by Congress. The Constitution gives Congress the power of regulation, and we delegate that power in limited ways to agencies within the executive branch. Uh, in similar ways that the judicial branch interprets written law, the, these agencies are supposed to interpret the will of Congress. And yet, uh, as Chevron exposed, there have been multiple instances where the agencies just took the ball and ran with it. And so what I told uh, to both the chairs of the FCC and the FTC when we spoke about this in hearing last week is, uh, you know, look, if you lack clear authority to do something that you think needs to be done, please come talk to us so that we can grant you that authority with the appropriate safeguards on that authority. Uh, because we're all on the same team at the end of the day. Uh, but don't do what was done uh, under Chevron and some of the related cases where you uh, seize authority that you were not given. Uh, and I actually think that that's going to achieve a very workable balance. Uh, and I think it's a good development, not a bad development. Well, it, it certainly makes... Uh, heightens awareness in Congress if they want certain things done, especially with with the AI issues in array before us to uh, give the regulatory authority. If, if you're going to put it in their hands, then they need to have the ability to do something, right? right. Dr. Ansharza, we're running, uh, we just ran out of time. So I'd like to uh, thank 
Congressman, for being here today. I've truly enjoyed the, the presentation as much as I've enjoyed visiting with you in Washington, D.C. It was a very interesting meeting. Uh, we're really proud and, and honored that you uh, accepted the invitation to be with us today. You've said a lot of things that really um, resonated with me as how you enhance AI to enhance the faculty, not to substitute the faculty, but to make them more productive, to serve the students better, to provide 24-7 support in multiple languages. Uh, I fully agree with you on the content production. I think AI is going to be uh, one of the, the, the greatest tools to produce uh, quality uh, moving forward, the very low cost, much lower than what has been so far. I fully agree with you with the personalization of education that eventually you're going to provide a, a, an academic path and an academic program that is individually made for each student based on the way they learn and uh, the outcomes they're looking for. So. Um, I truly um, appreciate having you here, Congressman, and I look forward to the next opportunity of visiting together. Well, thank you. Absolutely was, inspiring. It was an honor to be here, and uh, uh, please keep let's keep the conversation going as the task force finishes its work this year and moves into the implementation phase next year. Uh, and just uh, I've kind of been monitoring the the questions as they've come and gone on the on the scroll here. Uh, you know, one thing I just wanted to mention as we close, uh, I am very optimistic about the ability of Congress to get this job done. Uh, I know there's been a lot of dysfunction. I know that people focus on the partisan divide in Congress, uh, but there is nothing about AI that I see to be a partisan issue. And I, I think that uh, my my chair, Congress co-chair, Congressman Liu and I have done, uh, you know, set, set a, a good pathway for working together on a bipartisan basis. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I think that the Congress is up to the task of doing this. So, uh, you know, please let's keep working together as, as we approach this issue. Uh, and let's everyone keep focused on, you know, the upside as well as the downside.